Welcome back to Restaurantopia. We're here on a beautiful, snowy January morning in Cleveland. If you're listening to this elsewhere, hopefully the weather's a little bit better. Um, but we're here. We're back at it. 2023. Anthony's got a great episode queued up here on predictions for 2023 for the restaurant industry and just the industry in general, I would assume. Imagine a perfect world where you can build a restaurant, open the doors, and make loads of money. Unfortunately, those days are over. It takes great leadership, hard work, and long hours to operate a successful restaurant. Together, we can make it happen. This is Restaurantopia. Anthony, good morning. What's going on? Hey, what's happening, man? How are you feeling? I'm doing great. Are you sure, though? I'm doing, I'm doing great. You had a rough day yesterday. I am doing great. Okay, I want to stop I, I talking you, about it then. When you, when you can start the grieving process in the fourth quarter, it's a lot easier. Uh, that makes sense, so, yeah. So last year was way more traumatic because literally down Boy. to the last second, like we had won the game. But <sighs> that um, game this, last this year, year, to be able to sit back and, and start the start the stages of grief uh, early, like helped out, I think. I, I was uh, yeah. in a way better place mentally. What was it last year? You guys were playing the Chiefs in a championship game, right? And you guys were up like a no, touchdown. It was a, it was a divisional round again. Was it? So you guys were up like by three with like eight seconds to go. And Mahomes is like, I'm just going to score a touchdown. Uh, actually, we were up by three with 13 seconds to go. <laughs> I was and exaggerating. They, and <laughs> That's kicked, crazy. And they kicked a field goal to tie, to tie it, to put it in overtime. overtime. Yep. And the coin toss, Mahomes got it. Well, and at that point, your defenses were so tired. There was no way anybody was stopping anybody. Yeah. Whoever won that coin toss was winning the game. So, yeah. you know, and that's and why they changed that. the rule. That's why they changed the rule this year that in overtime, even if you score a touchdown, the, the other team gets an opportunity to, to score as well. Ah. Right? The, the previous rule was uh, you score a touchdown, you win. So I miss the days of sudden death. We can just march down and kick a field goal and it's over. Much simpler <laughs> then, except for when your team didn't win the coin toss. Exactly, exactly. Right on, right on. Well, let's get this thing started, man. So we're at that with that time of year now where, you know, I, I deal, uh, you know, a lot of operators are starting to look forward to what they're going to change. You know, we get that introspection in, in January, maybe because it's just you turn a new leaf to the year or because maybe your business is a little slower dealing with that like January law, you know, like the post Christmas kind of slog. Um, a lot of folks are looking internally and, it, and it's, it's interesting because you see a lot of the, the publications are now putting out their trend pieces, what they expect for 2023. And I ran into this article, um, I think two days ago, I was reading it from Nation's Restaurant News and I, I, I can't stop thinking about it. And they had 36 slides on there. And most of them were amazing. And so I wanted to run you through a couple of them and get your thoughts and kind of unpack these a little bit, because I'll be honest, like as much as they were great slides, they didn't really extrapolate the information and offer any sort of commentary or narrative to it. Right. And I'm like, my God, what a great foundational piece. Well, let's go ahead and bring that into Rest Restaurantopia and talk about it, because I think there's a lot of value here. Okay. I'm looking forward to it. Let's do it. Well, good, man. Good. So one of the things you're going to love this too, and I think a lot of our former guests it, it probably would, it says, I quote, TikTok will be more visible real estate than the corner of Maine and Maine. How do you feel about that? I like that because I think uh, as we've talked with with ourselves and also with you know guys like Sean Walshef, you know, it's I think it's going to be a big deal. And, and there's still there's still organic growth that you're able to have with your content on TikTok. No, I, I think I think it's still a huge player. Well, it's funny you mentioned Sean because he's actually part of this article. They used him. Um, they interviewed him for one of the slides. Yeah, so nice. it's just yeah, he's kind of an expert. So yeah, he's kind of um, out there. Yeah, I agree with you. So they put out some data there, which I thought was crazy. Fifty three percent of millennial TikTokers have visited a restaurant and or ordered food from it after seeing it on TikTok. Thirty eight percent of TikTok users across all generations, approximately fifty one point eight million diners have visited a restaurant or ordered food from it after seeing a TikTok video about it. I'm pretty sure seventy five percent of those folks were it's a chicken salad, folks, but still <laughs> they count. Right. But listen, all jokes Dude, aside, that's one, that's one example in Cleveland. Ohio. That's what I'm saying. Or, that's you, what I'm you saying. Know, you, you go to even Akron, Ohio, 40 minutes away and people may, may not even know about that phenomenon you know what i mean like yeah. unless they listen to cleveland news but i'm saying like it you know you don't have to go that far for people to not be aware so just imagine all those we'll call them mini viral experiences and if you and if you're not familiar with the the chicken salad thing it was 81st street deli you know they did a tiktok video with they were interviewing a customer hey what are you eating there and she's like oh it's a chicken salad and she names out the ingredients and it literally i don't know what i mean it's millions of views right uh, oh, uh, yeah like i, I would it got to be 50 100 million views yeah crazy 
place, this place, not only did they get busier, they were, they were getting deliveries five, six days a week. They couldn't keep up. They had people traveling from all over the country to go, to go eat at their location due to this one TikTok. Now, listen, this is an extreme example. It's not like TikTok does this all the time, but it's kind of like winning the TikTok lottery, right? You never know what's going to happen with the algorithm when you put out a catchy video and who's going to love it and share it. So the fact is, if you're still scared of TikTok, go do something. Because, man, that that video was so rustic, Dave. It was unedited. It oh, was unscripted. It was it was it was it was potentially garbage content. But I, but I'll tell you one thing. I'll say is if you want a guarantee for TikTok, you will never go viral if you're not on it. <laughs> that's that's profound. Okay. You're like Confucius over there. <laughs> I know. Thank you. Yeah, so, you're um, that, yeah, you, you, it will never happen. Okay. So so here's the thing. Like, be there. But if you go back and you look at that account, that wasn't their first video. Okay. They they, they had literally for months and months and months did the same thing. A customer's eating food. The guy walks up with the cell phone, says, Hey, what are you eating? The customer describes it and he posts it on TikTok. He was doing that for months and months and months prior. Mm -hmm. That particular video, for whatever reason, just happened to catch. But but that doesn't happen just doing one video. No. That comes with but consistent content. That's it. And, and think about all the time he spent. He literally just interviewed a customer for three seconds. It's not even him talking. I mean, just for the one second. Hey, what you eating? I love that, that, that real life testimonial, right? And then he's got the opportunity to whether post it or not, depending on how it comes out, right? But it, to your point, he had posted a bunch. So he was kind of, you know, not super particular about what he posted. He really leveraged that organic kind of customer response thing. And I absolutely love that. So anyway, TikTok's a big deal. Get on it if you can. Um, if you're scared of it, go out and break some stuff. If we can help, let us know. Moving on to the next one, Dave. Unemployment climbs for better or for worse. What do you make of this? Unemployment climbing. Is that good or bad? Uh, unemployment climbing does not sound good. It's usually good for our industry. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because we're like, it's, it's one of those things where like the restaurant scene was always a safe haven, right? Like if you couldn't get a job anywhere else, you can always go be a line cook. Mm. So, yeah. Right. I now the bad news. The bad news about that is, is if, if, um, you know, unemployment's up, the economy is typically bad. So people are going out to eat less. So it's kind of like a catch 22. Um, I think in the article, they said, pick your poison, which I, I absolutely agree with. Um, but we are seeing restaurants staffed up a, a little bit better now. I know we're not a hundred percent, but we are definitely flirting with pre pandemic levels. And I think that's good shape compared to what we were dealing with even a year ago. It's been nightmarish, right? Yeah, no, I would agree. And, and I think there's still a blend. I mean, I think that you still got operators that are struggling and, and you've got ones that sure. are, you know, are definitely saying that it's better. And I think it, it comes down to, you know, maybe a little bit of geographics, but more so probably how you're operating your restaurant. You know what I mean? And you still, it goes back to like, if you're operating it the old fashioned, you know, way that restaurants run stereotypical fear and mandate. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's probably, you're probably the ones considering closing another day or consider, you know, whatever it is. Um, yeah, no doubt, man. And, and again, we, we all know it stems from company culture, right? I just talked to us about this with Josh on uh, restaurant marketing school. Um, culture is not, not done overnight. So if you find yourself in a position where your culture is not good, well, you got to change it, but don't expect immediate results. This is, this is something that's carved over time. Kind of like Michelangelo's David, right? Sure. <laughs> I'm not sure why that reference came to my head, but that's his, I guess, uh, good things uh, come to those who wait. But again, as, as an owner operator or a leader in an organization, always remember you're a role model and always remember you set the tone. I think I heard a quote the other day that said, be the thermostat, not the thermometer. Mm. Be the thermostat, like not to th as a leader like of an organization. That. And I love that, right? And the more I think I about it, the more I love it. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, man. I want to leave that there. We'll move on to the next one because, again, you know, for our industry, selfishly speaking, unemployment going up does typically help us traditionally, historically, all that sort of jazz. Um, obviously, it's not great for the economy, but a little bit of it will help us get staff back up. And hey, there's a lot of optimism around uh, the labor pool these days, which is a far cry from where we were. How about this one? Low tech becomes a counterpoint trend. Low tech becomes a counterpoint yeah. trend. Yeah. So, what it's saying is now this is like, do you know in grade school when you went to like the the old um uh what are they, like the farmstead places and you had the little old ladies dressed up in like old timey garb and they're like churning butter with heavy cream and as a kid you would go and they would show you how the pioneer days worked and that sort of thing. Sure. And it was cute and it was nostalgic yeah. and it was fun and it was cool. Yeah. That's what they're that's what they're saying about restaurants with like handwritten tickets. So like your sleepy little mom and pop diner is now going to be a nostalgic play. 
right? So uh, of all the talk we talked about, like tech stacks and getting on the forefront and those people who are slow to evolve, it might just pay off for them because now they're the counter trend, right? Now it's like, oh, let's get a break from the, the a break from the, the, the rigors of the digitally paced universe and we'll go back to small town USA and eat at the sleepy diner where they still handwrite tickets. Yeah, right? yeah. Is it, is this, is this, this sounds similar to like uh, people that used to become Apple users because they were the anti-establishment. Now they are the establishment, but yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I, Absolutely. I no, that's, you know? that's exactly it. But then it just flips all the time, right? It and just they, start, and they start shaming the Android users, you know I mean? I mean, no, no one does that. Listen, I, I, I've witnessed it. Well, see, here's my thought is like, I don't need to shame Android users because I know they're already ashamed of themselves. So I don't mm. have to like pile on, you know what I mean? And, and there it is. <laughs> 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 I had to slip that in there. But anyway, low tech becoming a counterpoint trend. I thought that was interesting, right? And I, and I tend to agree with it. I mean, we all have a, a um, kind of a soft spot in our heart for nostalgia. So for those of you who have been slow to adopt the technology, hang on. You might just be in play soon. Yeah, keep your bell bottoms. <laughs> That's it, man. That's it. So up next, hybrid ghost kitchens. And then in those kitchens. Yeah. So in conjunction with that, they had a slide on that. And then there was a slide on smaller dining rooms, bigger kitchens. So what it's, what's it's talking about is that what we're seeing is the takeout game is so strong. It's so strong. And I, I had to think about this in my life and I'm like, my God, like, yeah, I, I probably get takeout five times to one. Like I get takeout five times and I eat in once. I don't know how it is with you and your family. But we're busy and it's just, and, and we all eat different things, right? Because uh, I'm on a different diet. My daughter likes different things. So it's easy for us just to stop at two different places and grab dinner and bring it home, right? And I started thinking about that, like, my God, because, you know, growing up, it was always like a, a 60-40 split in restaurant design. It was always 60% dining room, 40% kitchen. And now you're seeing quite the opposite where it's maybe 30% dining room, 70% kitchen. So those folks who want to dine in, there's a, there's a lower constituency of them now. So they need less space, less real estate. And now you can have real estate in the back to pump out the to-go orders and things like that. And then also, too, if you have a ghost kitchen which now we know ghost kitchens as kind of being in a warehouse somewhere in an industrial part of town, right? We didn't worry about curb appeal. So what they're, they're kind of getting to here is like the new, uh, new style of ghost kitchens, much like the uh, Chipotle uh, digital lanes, right? Yeah. To where it's a ghost kitchen for all intents and purposes. There's no, no real customer interaction other than the fact that you ask someone for your bag of stuff. Um, but it's all done online. It's all you drive to the place and pick it up. It's kind of a brilliant model if you can pull it off. Now, their brand recognition is a little bit stronger, so it's easier for them. But we're seeing more and more of it. And they're talking about these, especially in major metropolitan areas, where, yeah, you have a ghost kitchen, but you have some curb appeal. Now, you don't need the big parking lot. You don't need the big dining room. So it's kind of that hybrid model where you don't have to go all in on the investment the same way. But what you're seeing is like temperature controlled boxes to pick up your food and stuff, much like the racks that they have. And they're starting to get really, really kind of inventive on how they're displaying the food and how they're they're operating the transaction. And they're adding just a dose of hospitality in there, just someone to tour guide you through it. So you still have the interpersonal connection. So the word hybrid really kind of rings true here. Okay. I thought that was I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah, so, and I think that I think that's something that um, can definitely be expounded upon. Like, and, and I think people probably, you know, using their current kitchen space, it makes sense to me. You know, what I mean that that you know Chipotle's got the second line. You know, what I mean, but if you've got enough kitchen area where you can do that, you know, that's definitely something to consider because you can have a whole separate revenue stream, you know, coming in that you might not have been able to have just with a little twist on the menu. You know I mean? Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And, and for those operators looking to scale a little bit and, and maybe they're a little bit apprehensive about the large investment, they want to get the huge build out, the huge parking lot, the huge signage, the huge everything. This might be the sweet spot for them, right? Especially if they have a strong brand and they boast a lot of carry out because then they can just, you know, expand their geographical region and say, hey, look, you like my restaurant. I'm available here. Right. Yeah. And I think that, uh, you know, it's kind of like the dual concept kitchen that, you know, we, we would see a little bit where, you know, you had a big restaurant space and then you kind of like remodel the, the, the inside to where it's all two different concepts out of one kitchen. Well, essentially this is, you know, it could be similar, only one's a remote, you know, virtual ghost kitchen, whatever you want to call it, you know, going out the back door, you know, rather than, uh, than going into the dining room. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I see that it, it's, I see it with a new concept that's going in Cleveland on East 55th where they have a giant restaurant and then one small corner of it is a takeout version, like a miniature takeout version of that restaurant. So they have maybe like three people in this tiny kitchen off to the side to take away some of the takeout and off-premise traffic 
from the major kitchen. So that way they're not inhibiting the in, in-house experience for those diners. Um, I think it's kind of cool. I, I'm interested to see where this goes, but I see a lot of viability in this. Yeah. And I like that because I've had operators tell me that, you know, they're doing so well with carryout right now and carryout is strong and their concept is, is a heavy carryout concept, regardless of the current climate, that it's actually slowing down their internal dining a little yeah. bit because they've got so much carryout. So the ability to be able to have the separate line or have a separate location or whatever it is and kind of funnel that, that off of your, your dine in, you know, could be the right move for your, you know, for your business. Yeah. Not only that, but you're actually increasing your sales per square foot, which is a, a definitely a KPI that high level operators look at. And you got an empty dining room all the time. You might as well put some sort of money-making machine in there, right? And this is a perfect opportunity to consider that. And hopefully this gives you a little courage to do just that. So we, we talked about the next one and this is near and dear to my heart. It's a little bit self-serving, but value deals look to increase foot traffic. Value is what we talked about. I think last time you and I chatted, yeah. we talked about yeah. the trends upcoming, right? And yeah. we were talking about how, how important it is because people are fatigued, man. And I, I know you probably feel it too, being a family, but it's sometimes you go to the grocery store, you're like, for real, I'm going to pay this much for eggs or this much for a loaf of bread. Like it's exhausting, right? So you get fatigued from it. So it's nice when you go somewhere and you're like, oh my God, I got a good deal. I actually got one over on the operator. I feel like I won because I haven't felt like I've won financially in over two years, right? As a consumer, like, I feel like I'm just overpaying for everything. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so you're getting beat up on, all, on both ends. Yeah. That's what I'm saying, man. So I would, I would absolutely love to see more value deals. Is this, this article and these experts are saying is going to happen. You know, they say a lot of restaurant consumers are going to be cutting out restaurant budgets a, a decent amount anyway. And they, they argue that quick service and, and maybe mid scale are going to hit hardest based on their research anyway. I guess the way to drive traffic and, and combat that is, is deliver value, right? And, and for two years, we didn't have to. Two years, we were all about survival. And it was just like, let's raise prices. The customers are going to be supportive. And the customers were supportive. You, we did. You know, a lot of operators did a lot of good business during the pandemic at almost egregious pricing because supply chain was so jacked up. That's what the, the operators had to do. And the customers didn't bat an eye. They were educated. They were supportive. They spent what they needed to spend. But I think we're kind of ending at the end of that pattern. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. Go, go back real quick. What, 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 what segments were you say we're going to get hit the hardest? Quick service and mid scale. Wow. That's interesting. So what that tells me, or at least my knee jerk on that is that People are going to, you know, really doing what you and I had described in the last episode was not going out as much, maybe spending more or less often, you know, so those lunch, those, those during the week meals and those lunch meals and those things that people might've done, they're, they're, they're cutting those out first and then still dining. Yep. I mean, if I'm reading between the lines a little bit, it sounds like because it's quick service and mid meal, that's really, that's more of your, you more of that, that time of the week where. So that's interesting. So as an operator, you really almost have to take maybe the Josh Copel method of doubling down on your busy days, you know, and figuring out how to make the most revenue in those days rather than trying to fight a losing battle during the week, you know. Well, if it is a losing battle, you know, again, we have to go back and look at our costing and we have to look at our pricing and we have to reevaluate that. And just because we've gotten away with high prices for, for you know, some time. Um, is there an opportunity to lower in some areas to deliver more value and get customer trust back? Right. Because again, once a customer gets tired of this, they stop trusting you. Right. When they start seeing other prices go down, maybe they don't understand that food inflation is a lot stronger than, than other inflation that's going on in the world. Food inflation is still astronomically high for whatever reason. Maybe they don't have that understanding education. So they're going to start looking at you as maybe being a little bit greedy, so to speak. Right. So it's a good idea to flip that perception, in my opinion. I, well, I really strongly I feel yeah, but I think it's important. I think it's important to note that, you know, the, the value you're providing, like don't try to provide the value on the days where you're busy anyways. Correct. You yeah, know, you don't need to, yeah, right. you don't need to cut into your profits on the days that people are going to be there. Rather provide the value on those slower days. Um, you know, and again, it could be an uphill battle a little bit, but but again, value, I, I agree. And let's not kid ourselves or, or trick ourselves. Value doesn't necessarily mean cheap. That's fair. Right? Let's, That's fair. Let's not get those misconstrued because yeah, they, yeah. Value doesn't have to be cheap at all, as a matter no, of fact. You, yeah, no, you still need to provide a value at the higher ticket level. So yeah, you know what, that, that's, that, that makes complete sense. Yeah. Yep. So focus on value, you know, make sure that, that if you were a consumer, you'd be happy with what you got. Look at your takeout boxes, look at your sort of stuff and say, look, if I paid 20 bucks for this, how would I feel feeding my family? Right. Sometimes you got to juxtapose yourself. Oftentimes we look at the business, you know, not from a customer angle. And we, we talked about this time and time again, you, you have to put yourself in their shoes sometimes and try to keep an open mind. All right. Next one flexibility becomes crucial to recruitment retention when it comes to staff. Flexibility is now the most important piece. 100%. 100%. Yeah. If you, you know, if you're looking to just drive your employees and push hours and man, 
you have to be flexible. You got to, you got to give them options. You got to work maybe more people with less shifts and hours and, you know, no question. Yeah. So with this, and they had mentioned some technology, I'm working with a customer right now and adopting some scheduling software. And what it comes down to is, is especially with your service staff, it's, and it can work with your kitchen staff so long as they're cross-trained to a certain degree, but kitchen staffs are much more siloed, right? They're, they're more specialists of their own area. They're not generalized. Like, a server, and I'm not taking away from their skill set because it is definitely a skill set, but every server on the floor essentially does the same job. You know what I mean? Like, so you have 10 servers, they're all doing the exact same job. Your, your six people in the kitchen are not doing the same job. One's expo, one's grill, one's fryer, one's oven, right? So like, it, it may be not transferable, but with the servers, it's easy. So what it comes down to is these, these um, scheduling softwares and platforms, they, they're not new. Like, they've been around forever, but they kind of create an open market for your staff to trade shifts and kind of dictate their own schedule. And as a viewer and operator have done a good job of hiring and training, and basically most of your servers are interchangeable. I know not all of them are going to be. Certain people have certain skill sets that are irreplaceable on certain nights. I get that. But for the most part, you can allow your staff to dictate their own schedule once you've authored it, right? So if I put Susie on three days a week and she wants to work two, she has an opportunity to go into the scheduling software, throw up a proposition and say, hey, look, I'm giving up my Wednesday shift. Who wants it? And then someone else can chime in and be like, yeah, I'd love the hours. And then the manager approves and away you go. And it takes out a lot of the headache if you're still doing your schedules manually, because then, you know, it doesn't really involve the manager except for the approval button. And then once it's approved, the schedule changes and then you can hold those individuals accountable for being on time and being at their shift. Right. Yeah. And. I love that because it puts the onus on the employees. I would love to hear some negative negativity about that. If anybody out there has some thoughts on that, because man, it's like, I, I just can't see the negatives at this point. No, I feel, I feel this is, this is the way things are going to run from now on. It, it's going to, it's going to be important, you know, whether it's the, the, the schedule swapping and, and, and sharing of availability and, and whether you do it as like a, you know, almost like maybe the first day of this of scheduling is almost like an auction and then, yeah. and then yeah. it auto populates based on how many hours that people want you know, or something like that or seniority or whatever it is, you know what I mean? And, but, but you have the ability to have people kind of select what they want to do and then fill in the gaps and then give them the ability to switch it around. You know, That's I think, it. I think if you allow that, you're going to be able to retain employees a lot better because they're going to sure. love having that aspect of their life being a little bit more in control. You know, there's no you question man. The days of like, uh, Hey, can you get together? It's like, well, the schedule comes out on Tuesday. Let me, you know, let me see what I'm scheduled. You know what I mean? Like, it, you know, where you're like, nah, you, you know, yeah, I can, yeah, I can most likely do Wednesday because I'll find somebody to work, you know? That's it. And that's always been going on, but this hyper expedites it and makes it much more efficient, makes it much more likely. And everybody kind of is going, it's not just your one or two people that you call, everybody has access to it, right? Well, so it's and much also more you, said, you said accountability, you know what I mean? So, you know, next thing you know, like Sally was supposed to be working and, and you're the, you're managing and John shows up and you're like, what are you doing here? He's like, oh, yeah. well, I switched with Sally. He's like, oh, well, thanks for the heads up, you know? <laughs> Yeah, that happens. Or two people switch shifts and, and one person doesn't show up. Well, yeah, I didn't know right. it was approved. And it's like, right. no, now, yeah. And it's just a mess. But this is a very clean process. And again, the shift changes can't happen without the manager pushing the right. button. Yeah. So I think it's a good start. Now, figuring it out for the kitchen is a little more difficult. But really, what it comes down to is more cross-training. And a lot of places have people cross-trained anyway. Now, with kitchens, I think you have to be a little more strategic on busy nights specifically. But during the week, you could probably offer something similar, um, especially at your, your less skilled station, so to speak, right? Do kitchen people need days off? I, didn't, I thought they just worked all well, the time. I was told they didn't deserve days off, so I oh, never yeah, asked for okay. one. But yeah, looking back um, to your point, yeah, I never got invited to things because my friends knew that I wasn't going to miss work. Like. <laughs> I I remember there was a 15-year span, Dave, where I called off one time because my wife had a medical emergency that I absolutely had to be there for. I called off. And I even tried to go into work. And my boss is like, what do you think? Just take the day off. That was 15 years I felt acceptable right. to call off one time. You don't yeah. think I was sick or don't think I had a funeral or a wedding or anything else in that 15 years? I skipped them all. Yeah. And and looking back on that, it, it was good. I love my career and all that jazz. But man, I, I would not advise mm -hmm. my kids to go down that road. Right. Yeah, yeah. Sure industry needs to change and, and it has changed quite a bit already, whether we realize it or not. And, and the pandemic had a large hand in expediting that process as we talked about before. No question. All right. Let's hear from our good friend, Sean here. Delivery expands the definition of a restaurant. So Sean says, Sean Walsh, if this is the restaurant PL is going to look a lot different in five years. And when we talked to Sean, if you remember correctly, one of the things that, that he said when he was on restaurant topia, one of the episodes he was on, he said, uh, I'm not in the barbecue business. I'm in the delivery business. And I thought that was really kind of profound, right? And I started thinking like, no, man, you make barbecue. Like, come on, let's not over glorify it. But to his point, 
He is absolutely right. Figuring out the delivery is the most important part about making money in his brand. His barbecue is great and it's always going to be great. Let's say his store does $2 million, you know, with no delivery, no nothing. But with delivery, he can jack that up and he's got ghost kitchens all over San Diego. He can jack it up to five, six, seven, eight million just with the delivery concept. So you talk about scalability. It's not necessarily about more, more curbside locations, but about more commissary locations to get the delivery out faster. And that hit me like a ton of bricks. I absolutely agree with them wholeheartedly. When you have people that are 20 miles away that clamor for your brand, making your brand more accessible is scaling. Yeah. No, for sure. I mean, and I think that, uh, again, like being in front of that customer is not the billboard, is not the curb space, like you said. It's it's being accessible on the platforms, having your own platform. Like, yeah, because everybody's, everybody's on these. Yeah, no doubt. All the time. Yeah. All the time. And listen, they have they had many, many slides about the cell phones, but I left them out because I, I felt they were pretty obvious, but they're worth a read. And we'll share this article with you. I just thought it was just such a really good piece by them um, and some really interesting notes. But anyway, Sean carries on actually to say, he says, uh, you know, the restaurant, the way the restaurant looks now, again, that P&L thing, he's selling merchandise now with his brand, right? And then he does podcasts and he makes money on his social media podcasts. presence. Podcasts. <laughs> Pod- can you believe he does podcasts? This is the most amazing thing. Talk about podcasts. Podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that that is the best press conference other than <laughs> Denny Green's. They are who they thought we were. We let them off the hook. <laughs> I love that. Shit. Those are classics. Now the kids today will never, never understand. No, please email us if you get that reference. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So anyway, um, he said talking about TV shows and spices and and all this retail space now. So it's like it's not enough just to have a restaurant. You're creating a delivery platform or a delivery brand, and then you have a multimedia brand as well. And if you look at what Sean does, that's, that's exactly his model. He's got like five, six different monetary facets to his establishment from retail to media to barbecue. And at the end of it is actually food. He does have really good food too. Yeah. Um, it's easy to get lost in a shuffle, but it's wild what he's doing to expand his brand. Um, I, I could definitely see that being uh, taken on by a lot of people who are like, have that gumption that Sean does. Yeah. No, and he's definitely somebody to follow if you're trying to, to, to figure things out or learn some new stuff. Like he's on the forefront. So yeah, there's no question, man. Guy knows his stuff. All right. Last but not least, sky high demand for restaurants. Hmm. Yeah. There's a lot of optimism in the industry, man. I'm telling you like that. So in the reason being kind of dovetails in what we talked about earlier, right? So restaurants have become more essential to consumers lifestyles throughout the past several decades. Listen, man, I, I taught cooking classes at a university. Can I tell you how many of my students came in the class and knew how to boil water? It's about 2%. About 2% had ever even turned on a burner. Wow, It's wild because delivery and, and food has become so accessible. And when you look at quick service models specifically, you can really fill in the, the days of the week meal wise. Um, and, and not just with fast food, but like healthier concepts. And, and certainly we have a host of independents under our umbrella and there's, there's a bunch of corporate chains out there to do a good job in this, like wholesome food at a reasonable price in a quick amount of time. There's a lot of it, right? And so that's the good news is that no one cooks for themselves anymore. So it bodes well for us restaurant people, right? Sure. And they're only expecting that trend to continue as these kids get older and older and get to the age where they're professionals and have disposable income to spend on food, then chances are they're going to continue to order food at a higher clip than we've ever seen before. Yeah, no, that's that's interesting, and 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 I can, and I can see that that playing out for sure. And so, as we speak to local restaurant operators, like, are you on the forefront? Are you taking the biggest piece of that market share? Being sexy, cool, updated, maybe nostalgic, as we talked about earlier. You know, yeah, where, yeah. Where, where's your where's your where's your niche where you're going to be able to capture those dollars effectively? And that's it. And it's multi pronged. Yeah. And it's multi-pronged, you know, there's no silver bullet for this, but positioning yourself, as you talked about, I mean, it comes down to social media presence, but especially your e-commerce, like on your website, is it frictionless for the customer to go on a couple clicks and they can pick it up and going back to that Chipotle reference, I'm not sure if you've ever done the digital kitchens, but what they've mastered is you can literally order and pay for your food in about 30 seconds. That's all the commitment you have. You, you bring up the app, you log in, you click what you want. Most likely your favorite order has been saved. Click it. Your payment has been saved. Click it. Done and done. You pick out your time, pick out your location. There you go. Go pick it up. No ass, no must, no nothing. Yeah. No, I love, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice. I, and I hate it that it's them. I can't wait to some independents do it, but I do admire what they do. And I think it's a great template for independent operators out there. Take a look at what they're doing and trying to adapt as much as that as you possibly can. Yeah. No, for sure. 
So anyway, I wanted to leave it on a positive note. Sky high demand for restaurants. Let's leave it there. It seems like a great place to stop. Yeah, I love it. I love it. No, thanks, uh, Anthony, for putting this together, giving us the opportunity to, to talk about it a little bit. If anybody's got any comments, questions, or anything regarding this, please reach out. We're always here to help. Other than that, thanks again, my man. And uh, we'll see hey, you. Hey, you got it, brother. Thanks it's for on. listening. Later. Hey, this is a high quality pod. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everybody. Take Cut. care. Cut. Adios. Thank you, thank you, thank you for listening to Restaurantopia. The gratitude that we have for each and every one of you spending your precious time to listen to this podcast is immeasurable. Please make sure to tell a friend about this podcast. And also, if you have any feedback for us, visit us on restaurantopia.com and drop us a line. You can also subscribe on your favorite place to listen to podcasts. Thank you and have a great day.